But I think we can probably get started then. Sure. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome um, Professor Philip Gurley, um, friend and collaborator of many in the IMO, and uh, goes back a few years. Uh, so he did his um, bachelor's and his master's in mathematics at Chalmers University in Sweden, and finished that in 2005, where I managed to convince him to come and do a PhD with me in Dundee at the time. And so from 2005 to 2008, we worked on essentially embedding neural networks in cellular automata to sort of mimic genotype phenotype relationships and evolve metabolism. It was a kind of crazy idea at the time, but now it seems that everybody's doing it, right? So that was kind of fun. Um, and then he went on to do a postdoc at the Niels Bohr Institute for two years after that in Denmark. And then um, he, went back to Gothenburg um, from 2010 to 2013 to do a postdoc with Sven Nylander at the Cancer Institute there. And it was at that time, um, there was an opportunity for it to come visit and spend a year in Tampa, which he did between 2013 and 14. And he managed to get a grant while he was here um, that helped, that bridged in some sense um, to his first sort of faculty position um, back in Chalmers. And there, you know, got his assistant professor and has slowly moved up the ranks and actually quite rapidly moved up the ranks when I think about it. Um, because it was just, I guess, last year that he got promoted to full professor. And so Philip um, has done all sorts of interesting research. Uh, but I want to tell a little personal story because he also introduced me to lots of really cool music. So back in, in Dundee, his little office was kind of just across from mine. And I used to be able to hear this sort of incredibly fast guitar and screaming coming from his office. And I would chat the door and go in and it would be so like ear bleeding loud. And it would be the opposite of the sort of music I would like. But then he would also like this really cool sort of jangly guitar stuff that he'd introduced me to. So he's got a rather diverse musical palette and has played in a band and even released a CD. Um, so he's, he's quite the all-rounder. So it's a great pleasure to welcome um, Philip. So please take it away, Philip. We're looking forward to hearing all about your glioblastoma work. Yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, Sandy, and thanks for the invitation to, to talk. Yeah, so uh, I will be uh, talking about mathematical modeling of glioblastoma growth. And this is work uh, done together with uh, the Nalander lab that Sandy mentioned that I have been collaborating with since uh, since 2010, basically. Uh, and uh, now, so what I'm going to talk about today are some our efforts to, to model different experimental assays of vibostoma uh, in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo. Um, so I'll, I'll start out by giving a brief introduction to to the topic, the disease. So glioblastoma is the most common primary brain tumor in adults. It has a very poor prognosis, uh, survival, median survival time of roughly one year after diagnosis. Uh, and the best available drug that we have, temozolomide, prolongs survival by roughly uh, three months. Uh, and this is then in combination with other therapies, um, so surgery uh, and radiation. Uh, and this drug has been around for a long time, a couple of decades. Uh, and, and people are still searching for, for new and, uh, and improved therapies. Uh, and this is one of this. So this is the sort of uh, overarching goal of, of, uh, of the work that Sven Lander and his group are doing. Uh, so why is this so, so difficult? And why is it difficult to treat uh, glioblastoma? Well, you have to uh, deliver the drug to a sensitive organ with a very specialized vasculature. So we have the blood brain barrier that we have to uh, take into account. Uh, these tumors are also highly infiltrative and uh, and diffuse, uh, so that makes it difficult for them for, to resect them surgically. Uh, <clears throat> they also display a high level of heterogeneity, so, so we see many different uh, mutations uh, in, in different patient samples, so, so that makes it also uh, more difficult to find a good therapeutic uh, target. Uh, so at Uppsala, where, where Sven is, is now, they have uh, established a biobank called the Human Glioblastoma Cell Cultures, uh, HGCC. 
uh, which uh, where they uh, acquire uh, samples uh, from a large region of Sweden, shown here. Can you see my pointer, by the way? Yeah. Uh, so they get roughly one case per week. Uh, during surgery, they, they, uh, they obtain a sample, and then they uh, grow these cells, both in, in, in sphere culture, but also in adherent culture. And these they call patient-derived cell cultures. And so I'll be coming back to that, um, to that term uh, several times. Uh, so, so when you're working with a biobank like this, you want it to be somehow representative of the well, disease in general. You. And here, the the sort of uh, gold standard that they're comparing themselves with it's the TCJ. Uh, so here's a look at how the age distributions vary in TCJ and HTCC. Here's the the, the sort of the ratio of of, uh, of the male to female, and this is comparing the different subtypes that are defined and how they, uh, what the, their frequencies is, uh, and also the survival of the patients. And we see that there's uh, the large similarities between the TCJ and the HTCC. Uh, and even if one goes into more detail and looks at, um, at what mutations are present in, in core pathways that are important in, in glioblastoma, then we see that the we see a, a roughly the same uh, mutation frequencies uh, in in these uh, in the TCJ and the HGCC. So this suggests that the, this is a, is a good uh, biobank uh, if we want to understand uh, the diversity of uh, of glioblastomas. Um, so the I had a lab brief question on that, Philip. So the, Sorry? No, I had a brief question. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you know the patient derived sort of samples, um, do we know that they retain the kind of diversity and character of their original samples? Because I know that certain cell uh, cancers, when they go into culture, they lose some aspects, right? Has that been quantified? Is that understood? So uh, I think that there is, there's probably some loss of, uh, of uh, diversity, but they, they are caref careful and, and uh, uh, they avoid uh, too many passages with the, with the cells before they actually do put them in, in different assays. So, so they freeze samples and then they can, they can go back to that sort of starting point and then expand and then do the, the assays. So, so they do take care of that. Then there is also uh, uh, a, a diversity within samples, but that seems to be more sort of dynamically maintained. Uh, so there is some phenotype switching going on. And there's a recent paper from, from uh, Sven's group where, where they looked at this. I don't have, I can't remember the, the name of the paper in, okay. in detail, but, but they show that these, these cells, they transition in between different uh, phenotypic states, um, which seems to maintain the, um, the diversity. Interesting, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, so the overarching aim here is to find new uh, treatments. So what they do, uh, because we see this diversity between patients in terms of outcomes, but also in terms of morphologies of, of, of the tumors, then uh, they want to characterize these patients' right cell culture. Uh, and on one side, they do it sort of on the uh, subcellular level uh, or uh, genetic side, or looking at sequencing, transcriptomics, and proteomics. Uh, but then they also have all these different experimental assays that I will talk about. Uh, uh, and the ultimate goal is somehow to connect these. And I'll come back to that at the, at the end of the talk. Uh, but what, what they want to do is define key drivers of, of GBM invasion and, and, and evaluate targeted treatments. And this is done in a, in a range of different uh, assays done. Okay, so what I will talk about today is uh, some work that we have been doing on in vitro data on uh, time-lapse microscopy images. And this is work done together with uh, my PhD student, uh, Gustav Lindvall. Uh, then we also have also looked at estimating uh, the rates of cell division and how that depends on uh, cell density. So what we see here is that we find an Ali effect. And this is work done with Philip Altrock that uh, you, you know, uh, former IMO member. Um, and then, uh, we have also looked at in vivo data. So this is data from a xenograft mouse model. And here we've used a, um, an individual-based model to try to recapitulate these growth patterns that, that are seen. Uh, and then lastly, I will talk about a very preliminary project looking at ex vivo data. So this is uh, 
brain slices that are cultured, uh, where we have fluorescent markers for, for vasculature and for cancer cells. And this is work by Hitesh Mangukia and Adam Malik. And I didn't say Adam, Adam Malik is my former PhD student who's now a postdoc with, uh, with Stan. Okay, so that's the, uh, an overview of, of the talk. Um, <clears throat> so, so we'll start out with this uh, time-lapse microscopy da data. So the question is that how do these uh, patient-derived cell cultures differ phenotypically? And then when I say phenotypically, I mean, how do, they, how do they differ in their migration rate, their rate of division, and how they interact mechanically? So they're the cell-cell adhesion. Uh, and what we have as the data here are these uh, bright field images or sequences of bright field images. Uh, and uh, from these, we want to figure out these, these, these phenotypic properties. So we have a, a image analysis pipeline where we take these images, we, we segment them uh, using a, not something, a, the Baxter algorithm, which is a, a software package, and then we also track them. Um, so we end up with basically tracks for cells, uh, and from that we want to figure out something about how they behave. But in order to do that, we need some sort of model. Um, uh, so this is, before I go into the model, I just wanted to show you basically what it looks like. So, so from a segmented image, image we, we perform tracking and the cells here are white and the tracks are in, in yellow. Uh, and we see that there is uh, quite large, a lot of diversity here. Some cells migrate a lot, whereas others are uh, basically stationary. Um, so, so that's what the data looks like. Um, Philip, if I can, Philip, if I can just jump in with a question. Yeah, sure. always, I always enjoy this statement of they move a lot, which obviously in the context of normal cells, they move a lot, but in the context of regular protists, they don't seem to move much. So when you say move a lot, um, what's kind of the linear distance traveled in 24 hours? Uh, actually, I don't have, uh, I don't, uh, I can't remember that, sorry. Um, but, 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 but what I said was more like a, a relative statement that uh, we right. see that some cells are migrating more than, than others. Um, right. Yeah. But what would be interesting, uh, Philip, is a lot of the stuff when I've had a chance to look at some of this kind of movement data, John Hopkins people and whatnot, a highly motile cancer cell often is one that moves a whole whomping 10 body lengths in 24 hours. Yeah. No, they, can, they can be very or highly motile, these cells, uh, definitely. Um, Okay, so uh, we model this with an individual-based uh, individual model that is off lattice. Um, so the cells are assumed to undergo sort of a Brownian motion, so a random walk, and they interact mechanically. So this is a, a simplification, as you might have noticed in the pre in the movie. We see that there's quite a lot of persistence in the in the motion. So maybe a uh, a, a persistent random walk would be um, more relevant uh, here, but we, we make the simplifying assumption that we, we, we stick with a, um, with a uh, Brownian motion. So, so this we can formulate as a stochastic differential equation uh, where the, the sort of the increment um, is, is driven by intracellular forces here. Uh, we define this as a gradient of the potential um, that looks like something like this, uh, so uh, which defines the uh, the force, uh, and then we have diffusion here. So sigma i here is the diffusion coefficient of um, uh, of um, uh, cell i. So we have a, a unique diffusion coefficient for each cell. Uh, and if we if we simulate this, then it looks something like this. Uh, this is just to illustrate that the cells are sort of moving about and uh, and and bouncing into one another. Uh, the potential that we that we use here is is very flexible. Turned out to be too flexible for our, for our own good uh, because uh, it was difficult to to actually uh, it identify it from from the data. But but we have a very general potential that that. <clears throat> does something like it has a it has a uh, repulsive part here where the cells are too close to one another and then we have some region here with uh, with attraction uh, and then 
very soon it goes to to zero so so when the cells are sort of close by they adhere when they get too close to one another they repel so this is just volume exclusion um and with this very general formulation uh, of the parameter we have uh, we have six parameters that determines the the shape of this potential um in in this uh, project here, we, we focus on migration and interactions and uh, we disregard cell divisions. And I'll come back to those. So we, we, we look at, we, we use another model uh, to, to estimate the uh, parameters that relate to, to cell division. So here we're, we're only uh, looking into migration and interactions. Okay, so we have our, uh, we have our potential. Uh, so we have the diffusion coefficient that one that's one parameter that we want to estimate and then we want to estimate the parameters that relate to the potential that determine the the interactions okay so i won't go philip, into any detail yeah. here because it gets let me clarify something philip briefly yeah because um so you know your diffusion um so you've got this constant term but it's got a w t in oh there. sorry so this is just the the sort of random increment so you can think of this as a uh, as a um uh, as a random uh, increment that is drawn from from a normal distribution. Um, All right. Okay. Yeah. But this is but 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 the way it's formulated as a stochastic differential equation means that it sort of it evolves in 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 continuous time. But as soon as you want to um, you want to simulate it, you have to decide on a step size, and then you get these increments. Um, um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, as I said, so the in, the inference part here gets very technical, uh, and uh, I won't go, in, go into any details here. But but what Gustav has done is that he's developed a, a, a new method for Bayesian inference uh, that is more appropriate than just a mean square displacement uh, method that is typically used, uh, especially if you're in a crowded environment. And I'll show some results for that. Um, when it so that's for the uh, that's for the diffusion coefficient when it comes to the interaction term uh things are not so uh easy and uh we can't formulate the the likelihood function that we need to do inference uh, analytically uh, and so we resorted to basically what is known as a surrogate likelihood which basically means that we have to simulate the uh we have to simulate the model forwards into from a given image to the next image and then uh, evaluate the likelihood uh, there, or we, we calculate the likelihood there. So, so I think it's better if I, I show uh, an image instead. So basically what we do is that given a starting point, so I have to move this image. So the, the cell starts out here at this downward pointing triangle. Uh, and then we, we simulate the, the model many times, um, thousands of times forward in time. Uh, that also includes all the other cells. So the cells are bouncing around, they're interacting. And then we, we record the end state and we generate a probability distribution of where the cell is uh, likely to be. Uh, and then we, the, using that, we can then evaluate what is the likelihood uh, for the, the, given the data. Uh, and this will be our, the, the, the triangle pointing upwards here. And in this case, we see that low probability is blue, uh, yellow is high probability. Here, we have, we, we've we generated uh, a, a probability distribution, which when we evaluate it, it has a very low probability. In, in this case here, we are, we are more successful and we get a much higher likelihood. Uh, so what we do when we do the inference is that we adjust our parameters for the potential and for the, um, for the diffusion coefficient, such that we find uh, that maximizes likelihood, basically. Uh, well, can you just briefly explain what the hell that is? Because I'm like, what does it mean, the axis here? What am I looking at? Well, so you're looking at space, uh, and you're looking at the starting position of a cell given right. in a one image, and then this is the end position of one cell. So what we generate is, a, we, generally, we calculate the probability of finding the cell at a certain location in the next image. Based on its previous position. Given, based on the previous position, yeah. Right. So in order and, to do that uh, in, a, in an accurate way, we have to do, carry out many, many simulations. 
Um, so are and, you and basically is, um, like reparameterizing your model or randomly sampling parameters? I mean, what's changing? Exactly, yeah. So, uh, and then we evaluate those that parameter set against the likelihood. And then, right, okay. uh, and then we, we uh, change the parameters in order to constantly increase this, the likelihood of the parameters given the data. Um, exactly. And so, you know, just, just in that um, sort of force function, whatever you said, there was six parameters. Exactly, yeah. So we're in a very... So you've got quite a lot to play with here. I know, and that's what I said. We, it's sort of too flexible. Uh, we yeah. realized that we, uh, after we did this, we realized that we, we need something simpler. And you could probably go down to three parameters uh, for, for the force function and still get something which is... Uh, flexible enough. So, so that's a lesson that we learned. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, this is to illustrate that this higher order method it does a lot better than just looking at the mean square displacement of the cells. Uh, and this, so this figure here shows uh, this is the estimate that. So this is on synthetic data. We've generated the the, the data with the model. And we're trying to estimate the parameters back from that data. Uh, and uh, here we're looking at uh, so so the dashed line here, or, or the is the uh, the true value. And here we're increasing the number of cells in a fixed region. So that means we're making them more and more dense. And this higher order method keeps on providing a a good estimate of the diffusion coefficient, even at high densities, whereas the sort of traditional mean square displacement method uh, loses accuracy at high uh, densities. Uh, and we can do the same thing with the temporal resolution. So here we're looking at the number of minutes between observations. Uh, and we see that uh, our, uh, our high order method keeps on providing fairly good uh, estimates uh, of the um, of the diffusion coefficient, even for very rather sparse measurements, whereas the mean square displacement me method uh, uh, fails to do so at, at uh, when we have a long time between observations. Uh, so, uh, so, and this is uh, uh, so this is uh, again a validation or what we're trying to. Uh, figure out how, how good the method works on, on synthetic data. And uh, uh, here we're trying to mimic the, the sort of the density uh, that we have in, in the actual data. And we see that if we have 40 minutes between observations, which is actually in fact what we have, then, then the model, uh, the, the inference method is, is not working optimally. But, uh, and, and similarly, we see um, that uh, when we're trying to um, identify the potential, we see that if we have 40 minutes between observations, then we basically see no interactions between the cells. So we get this red uh, line here, that's our potential, whereas the true one is the, is the, the black line. If we go to 10 minutes, then we do uh, a lot better. Uh, we still get a lot of discrepancy here at short distances, but that is mainly driven by the fact that we get very few observations that correspond to this distance. So cells rarely overlap or never overlap one another. And therefore we never learn how much they, uh, how, how large the repulsion is at those short distances. Uh, we've also tried to do inference on uh, actual data here. And this is from one of those cell lines or patient derived cell cultures known as U3013. Uh, here we have uh, 52 images that are taken 45 minutes apart. Uh, in total, it contain, contains 142 unique cells. Um, so what we see here, uh, the top one here shows the interaction potential that we have inferred and it sort of looks reasonable. The x-axis here is normalized in terms of cell diameter. So we see that at short distances, we have a repulsion and then we see, we see an attractive part and then at when you, when you go further out, further distances, then the cells don't interact at all. Um, when it comes to the migration rates or the diffusion coefficients, we do inference on each cell 
separately. So that means that um, this histogram here shows the distribution of uh, diffusion coefficients. Uh, and we do see a lot, quite a lot of uh, diversity here. Uh, a few cells that have a high diffusion coefficients, whereas there's some that have basically none, no diffusion at all and are, and are stationary. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that we will continue and, and in future work we will look at a lot more uh, cell lines here and try to compare uh, and see how do, they, how do they differ from one another. Um, and here we, you, can, you can also evaluate the accuracy of the model by, by looking at how well can we predict the trajectories of single cells, but then that will always, we'll always only work at very short time frames, so from one image to another. But, but here is an example of, so this is the starting position in, in one frame, and this is the end position in the other frame. And we see that we have the, 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 meth, the, the model predicts very, with a very high uh, probability that the cell will, will, will sit here. Um, when it comes to cell division, uh, we, we have the uh, situation that the, these Before you go on, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, my UPS thing has died. So if, like I just disappear into the darkness, into the void, it's because the power switched off. <laughs> That's what that weird noise is. But anyway, my question was, um, you know, one of the things we know is that the context in which the cells find themselves modulates their migratory behavior, yeah. right? And yeah. so um, you're doing this kind of trying to accurately model their migration dynamics. What happens if you change the nutrient levels or if they're, you know, interacting with neurons or whatever, you know, I'm thinking gray and white matter and all of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So that's a good point. So, uh, and that's something that we are hoping to address. So because we're estimating these phenotypic uh, properties in many different contexts, we the, the plan is then to compare them. So, so because uh, we, we also estimate uh, migration rates in the mouse brains in vivo, and then we will also do it ex vivo in this tissue slice culture. So the, it will be really interesting to look at, does the uh, in vitro uh, data say anything meaning, meaningful about the other contexts, or is it completely unrelated? We don't know. Th what they're, because this migration is in a, in a stem cell medium in a on laminin coated plates. So, I mean, it's not very, it's not the natural context in any way. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how, how they relate um, at least, but I, 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 yeah, I'm well aware of the difficulties. Um, yeah, you so know, when it comes to cell where, division, sorry, yeah. Um, Philip, yeah, so, you know, as you're probably well aware of, there's, kind of a, you know, at least a decade, perhaps two decade tradition of movement ecology of analyzing exactly these kind of data. And so are you <clears throat> simply rediscovering the existing analyses or does this add to the, you know, the body of existing software packages <clears throat> and whatnot that would estimate um, the parameters you were just estimating? And in particular, it seems like your work is perhaps repeating work of Wayne Getz and his lab and um, Ron Natan um, that, you know, kind of have worked out repulsion, diffusion, area restricted search, uh, migra migratory behavior, and all of these sorts of things. I think definitely there's some overlap and I'm, I'm not uh, uh, aware of all that work, but I think there's some novelty to it. So so what Gustav has done with the, with the higher order method has, to our knowledge, not been done before. So that well, so that's I would I'll be happy to pass where... it on. You may want to look at Wayne Getz. He yeah. actually has a whole website. Okay. I, I yeah, think Wayne Getz might, yeah, might beg to differ a bit, or you could see whether you've approached these things somewhat differently. Um, but in movement ecology, there's a lot of research on sort of intentionality of movement, deviation from Brownian movement, displacement, area restricted movement. We yeah. did run some analyses like those with some data that Sarah Amund has, and your data look a lot like it too, in which it looks more like this movement is more like wiggling. Um, 
Yeah. It's more of a wiggling mo movement than even so much as as sort of migratory. And one hypothesis that we've put out is that some of this wiggling in this movement may basically be trying to break up the boundary layers, the little tiny depletion zones that happen around the cells. They're not actually trying to go anywhere. They're not even trying to move randomly. What they're really doing is kind of like coral fronds, you know, in in or you know mussels and whatnot. Um, that they're really just breaking up the boundary layer so that mm. they have a fresh set of medium right on the surface of their membranes. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'd be I'd be interested to read more about about that. And really anyway, be happy. Yeah, don't I'd be happy to. And, and Wayne gets I actually in the case of Sarah Ahmed actually contacted him and he found the whole movement ecology business in cancer to be exceedingly fascinating. And he's got a team of postdocs and other folks you okay. know, that have thought very deeply about this for about 20 years. Mm. Well, thank, yeah, thanks a lot for the tip. Um, yeah, so when it comes to uh, cell division, uh, then these cells, the glioblastoma cells, are known to engage in autocrine signaling. So they they produce uh, growth factors that they they secrete, they produce and secrete growth factors that they themselves bind, and that in turn affects their uh, rate of, of cell division. Uh, and one of these growth factors is, is, is P, that has been the most explored is, is PDGF. Uh, so um, so when uh, when I started thinking about this, I I realized that it, it's very similar to some work that I have done before with with Philip Altrock, and uh, and it's uh, what this was published uh, three years ago, uh, and it's about uh, cooperation in a diffusive public goods game, and the setting there is very similar that you have you have a subpopulation that produces a public good. Um, it, it's released into the environment, and anyone who comes in contact with this diffusing public good. Has an, has an elevated rate of cell division. Uh, and I, I actually, I talked about this uh, at IMO, which is probably like four years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea is that we have an uh, individual-based model where we start out with that, uh, or a hybrid uh, cell or automata model where we model the concentration of the public good uh, as a continuous field. And then we have cells that are sitting on a lattice. Um, and uh, much of the, that paper is about deriving an, an effective model uh, in terms of a, a set of coupled uh, ODEs that describe uh, the uh, how the density of cooperators and free riders change over time. And it turns out that that model can uh, very well predict the long-term outcome uh, of the uh, individual-based model. And this is shown here. So we're looking at varying the public good diffusion coefficient over a couple of orders of magnitude and the cost of public good. And the sort of this surface here, the, the one that has sort of red edges here is the simulation with the uh, individual based model. And the one with the black edges here is the analytical prediction from this um, OD model. Uh, so that seemed to work fairly well. And in fact, when we're looking at these um, uh, cell cultures, then uh, they are fairly homogeneous, which means that we, we don't really have a, a population of, of producers and cheaters, but basically all the cells are, are producing um, the public good, which is the growth factor. So we're looking at a single population. Uh, and uh, we can again do the similar uh, analysis. So we start out with an individual based model, we go to a, a PDE model, and, and then we end up with an OB model. Uh, and, and this in the in the in the individual based model we have we have cell birth or division uh, that occurs with the baseline rate alpha and then this is the public goods concentration or the growth factor concentration so it increases linearly. Then we also have cell death with the rate mu. We have production of the public good with a rate rho. We have decay of the public good and then we also have cell movement at a certain rate nu. Uh, and uh, when we before had two ODs to describe the dynamics, we no, now only have one because we consider it every every cells are cells are identical. So we're looking at a single population. Um, so what it the the, the OD uh, looks like this. So we have a, a growth rate here, which is which is density dependent, and then we have uh, this term here, which looks like the logistic equation, and then we have a death term here minus mu n. I won't go into the details of what this looks like. It's a bit, uh, it's rather complicated, but but it, it depends on the properties of the of the public good. Um, so just to 
show you what this function can look like. Uh, I, I have these figures here. So uh, this shows the, the growth rate. So it's the, the, this whole expression as a function of the population density, which is now normalized. So it runs from zero to, to one. Uh, so in this, in the first green case here, which sort of goes off the chart here, uh, the, 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 the growth rate increases and then but then it hits uh, zero as we approach the carrying capacity of, of, of one. Uh, but these two cases here are more interesting because uh, because these correspond to the what is known as the Ali effect, uh, and it, it is uh, or actually both of those correspond to the Ali effect, but it's more pronounced in this case. But uh, what we in this plot here, we instead plot the per capita growth rate. So we take this right hand side and we divide by n. That's the only thing we've done. Uh, and the Ali effect is the fact that this growth rate here increases at low densities, has a maximum, and then decreases. If we would plot the logistic, the per capita growth rate of the logistic equation, we would just get a straight line with slope uh, minus one here. So, so the growth, the per capita growth rate would be largest at uh, at at low or at zero uh, density, and then decrease as we uh, as we get uh, higher and higher density. Here we see a situation where the population then where the per capita growth rate increases first and then decreases. The red uh, curve here shows the case of a strongly effect where the per capita growth rate is negative for small densities. And that means that we have the possibility of a population extinction, uh, because if we're below this value here, this population density here, the growth rate will be negative and the population will go to extinction. OK, uh, so as I said, we moved from, the, from an individual-based model to an OD. And first, we wanted to make sure that this actually works. Uh, and this is an example where the sort of wiggly line here is the individual-based model, and the dashed line is a uh, OD. And we start with different initial densities, and we see that they match fairly well. Here we also have a strong Lie effect for this particular set of parameters, because if we start at, out at a low density, then the population goes to extinction. We also wanted to check what happens if we increase the death rate, uh, because that is one way to uh, induce a extinction, uh, and so we we start out with a uh, with a low cell density, and then we measure the density after simulating the model for eleven days, uh, and the simulations are the circles, and the prediction from the ODE is the solid line here, uh, and we see that we can. So what happens is that as we increase the death rate, uh, the density after 11 days decreases, but then there is a rapid shift. We go, there's an extinction threshold, and then we have no population after 11 days. Uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, but this first model that we looked at, I should have said that, is a well-mixed model where uh, everyone is moving constantly at random. Uh, if we have a proper spatial model with no migration at all, then the model works less well. Uh, we, we overestimate the density after 11 days, and we, we also overestimate where the position of this extinction threshold. We, we say that it will occur here uh, for, for values of the death rate here, but in fact, it occurs much earlier. Uh, but if we crank up the migration rate to, uh, to what we find uh, that the cells in the experiments are actually doing, we see that we recover, at least in part, the agreement between the uh, the, the simulation uh, and the, uh, the analytical prediction. Uh, and we, we get a fairly good estimate of the, of the extinction threshold here from the analytical uh, result. So we uh, applied this model to data uh, obtained uh, from these image, uh, this um, high throughput microscopy data, where we extracted growth curves from three different PDCs. And they were plated at six different uh, densities. So we, we fitted the model so that so so that uh, to the, to all these curves simultaneously, uh, and uh, so the the growth rate looks something like like this. And we also wanted to compare our more complete this this model with the early effect with the simpler model. Uh, and there, if we set b equal to zero, 
we we recovered the logistic equation. So we we compared those two: the, the more complicated model and the the uh, Ali model. Or the, sorry, the logistic model. Uh, and what we see here, so on the on the on the right the 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 right column here shows the fit using the logistic model, and the left hand side shows the um, the Ali model. And we see that. Uh, across all these three cell lines, we see a much better fit uh, using the Ali model. And this can also be quantified by looking at the Akeiki information criterion and see what, that we consistently get a lower value um, for the uh, Ali model. Uh, and uh, we also note that we have a, a strong Ali effect for, for uh, U3123, this one. Um, but uh, when when we uh, so this paper uh, that describes this is coming out in um, in, in plus computation biology soon. Uh, but uh, we had a bit of a fight with one of the reviewers who said, "Well, you're just proposing one possible uh, mechanism for the Ali effect. It could be others." Uh, and of course, that's true. Um, so we had to sort of tone down our claims a bit, and we ended up changing the title of the paper from that we can that it explains to that we can explain the Lee effect. Uh, but but, but one way to go about this would actually be to look at what, what's going on uh, in the images. So uh, can we say, can, can we actually go down and look at how are cells affected by their local density um, when it comes to division? Uh, so, so then it poses another question is how do you define local density? And, and you can do this in many ways, but uh, you can say that you can count the number of cells within a certain distance. Uh, here we instead, um, uh, we, we sum over uh, the, the neighboring cells or over all cells using an exponential function like this. So this means that the larger the distance is between the cells, the less uh, uh, the neighboring cell contributes to the local density. And, and the, parameter, or the parameter A here is chosen so that uh, if we have confluence, then uh, the, the, the local density is one. So we normalize it between zero and one. Uh, and now with the tracked and segmented data, we can actually uh, count uh, birth and non-birth events between images. And we can look at what was the density of the cells that, that uh, experienced a birth versus those that, that, that didn't. Uh, and, uh, and we have, Gustav is working on this uh, uh, at the moment, and we have some just preliminary data on sort of a, a toy model, uh, which at least suggests that we we can infer this type of uh, this type of of, uh, of model. Um, and uh, so, what we will do then is is carry out this type of analysis on exactly the same data that we previously analyzed on the population level only. And the question is. If we look at this at sort of the, the level of the single cells, will we get the same estimates of the per capita growth rate compared to the population level perspective? Uh, so that's that, that, that will be very interesting to see. Uh, um, and this will also at least uh, partially sort of answer this question uh, or uh, see if, if is it actually the local density that, that, that determines the or that causes the early effect. Um, um, okay. Just a quick question. Yeah. Do you see any differences between the um, cell lines, I guess, in their allele effect or the susceptibility to the allele effect? Yeah. So, so you can. Uh, so here was one example. So here, we see that we get different types of of allele effects. So, so this middle uh, cell line here, U thirty one. 23 exhibits a strong Lee effect, whereas the other ones have a weak Lee effect. So, so there seems to be a difference. Uh, and one way to explore this further would also be to look at uh, what happens if we, um, if we inhibit uh, uh, or we block the PDGF uh, receptors. Um, does that change the dynamics? Uh, and, uh, and one can then produce sort of predictions from the model that could be tested. Uh, so that's one. And there we probably will see a lot of heterogeneity between the, the cell lines. That, that's my guess. Are these also reflected in the uh, curve that you showed in the next slide, the local densities? Yes, and exactly. So we, so we expect this sort of local density uh, or uh, the dependence to be very similar to the ones that I showed previously. Uh, 
where, where we're looking at the per capita growth rates. Um, so, so, so yeah, we, we expect them to be similar, maybe not exactly the same, but uh, yeah. And these curves will then be different for different cell lines. Exactly. Yeah, but you haven't computed them for multiple cell lines yet. This is just for one then, right? Uh, th so these are multiple cell lines. This is multiple cell lines here. So I could have yeah. plotted the corresponding growth curves, but I, I haven't done that here. Okay. Um, but it could be done, yeah. So as soon as you have these parameters here, you can compute the, the, the per capita growth curves, yeah. Uh, I've got a follow up okay. question, Philip. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've seen in uh, other cancers, in ovarian in particular, that the density of the population at seeding has a big impact on treatment yeah. responses. So, a question here is when you initialize these cultures, did you look at starting them with different populations versus, you know, one, one single population amount? So you mean at different plating densities or? To begin with, right? So you put in yeah. more cells right at the beginning or less cells and does that- Yeah, so, that, so that's what, uh, that's, oh, sorry. Uh, so that's what we've done. So, so you see here, here we actually start with different cell densities. Oh, that's what that means. Sorry, I thought yeah. that was the growth um, over time. Yeah, no, so, but we do start with different cell densities and we want the model to match, uh, to, to, uh, to be able to describe for all uh, initial densities. Um, Each one of so those lines look is at, a different density. Starting yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, ah, so it right. starts at a different density. Okay. And and if you take a single curve, then you can make the 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 uh, logistic equation fit each one in isolation. But when you ask the model to fit them all at the same time, then the LE model does a much better job than the logistic. Exactly. What happens at fifty hours? Is it confluence? I'm going to get past this slide. <laughs> no, no, I'm but is there a situation? Uh, so uh, no, so this is the uh, I think that was the duration of the experiment. Um, yeah. But what do you expect the, the curve to look like? Uh, I expect them to continue. Uh, and go, but it could be that the carrying capacity here is maybe not um, one, they could reach another plateau value, uh, but that would require one more parameter in the model. Uh, yeah, that we haven't that we haven't included. So of course, yeah, it could be that their their uh, the the density at confluence is not this is also cell line specific, exactly, and that we haven't accounted for, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay, so now we uh, switch gears a bit and uh, go from in vitro stuff to uh, in vivo. Uh, so, so what they do uh, is also in order to characterize these cell lines is to uh, label them um, with uh, luciferase, uh, inject them into, into mice and then monitor them. Um, because they can monitor the, the volume of the tumors. This is a high, this is a very unreliable measurement, so we don't really look at that. It turns out, but 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 what we look at is what happens at the end, where they sacrifice the mice, they dissect it, take out the brain, slice it, and stain it uh, for human antibodies. Um, so we end up with slices like this of the brain, uh, and it turns out that there is lots of different and distinct growth patterns that these. Uh, uh, cell lines uh, give rise to. So some invade a lot along the white matter. Some are uh, perineural uh, or gray matter invasion, whereas other one, the others are uh, like to invade along blood vessels. So they are the perivascular. Um, so uh, uh, this is something that Adam started working on when he did his PhD. So that's a couple of years back. Uh, and, and the question is, can we re recapitulate, recapitulate the growth patterns that we see and can we, can we fit the model uh, using this, this type of data? Uh, and it ha has turned out to be quite difficult. Um, but, uh, and so I'll, I'll describe our, our, our attempts here. Uh, so when you look at these growth, these tumors, it's clear that the, mouse brain anatomy uh, has a large impact and it guides uh, the growth of the tumor. Uh, and then and that, this is because it, it, 
it, it guides the, the, the migration of the cells. So how can we learn anything about the sort of anatomy of the, of the mouse brain? Uh, so one, one approach is to look at diffusion tensor imaging, which essentially measures mobility of water molecules in the brain. Um, so what you get from uh, a diffusion tensor imaging is a, uh, in each voxel of the brain, which has a roughly a spatial resolution of 40 micrometers cubed, you get a, a tensor, which describes how the water molecules um, uh, move. Uh, and then you, in order to transform this tensor into something sort of useful for modeling, you can go, you can, you, you can go in different directions. Uh, one way is to look at the fractional anisotropy, which is a measure of how directed the movement of water molecules is uh, at a certain voxel. Uh, and then you can calculate that and you, you see something like this. Uh, so, so here is a, a coronal slice of the, of the mouse brain and blue here represents low fractional anisotropy and, and yellow and red is high. Uh, and here we clear, here, so here is an anatomical structure where it, which is known as the corpus callosum, uh, which has a lot of white matter in it. Uh, and the idea is then that the diffusion tensor imaging says something about the anatomy, because if the, if the water molecule is trying to sort of enter into a fiber, uh, then it won't, along, instead it will move along the fiber. So, so that's the uh, th that's the logic. Uh, another way to analyze diffusion tensor imaging data is to do tractography. And here, uh, this is a computational method where you release test particles and you let them do random walk, which is uh, dictated by the diffusion tensor in some way. And then you can generate white matter fibers uh, like this. Uh, but it's also, as I said, we have this perivascular invasion. So we want to know something about the, the vascular uh, or the vascularity, and then there's you can actually find vascular atlases that are uh, that are mapped down to a, a resolution of five microns squared, uh, and this is done by uh, by treating the mouse brain with uh, with uh, chemicals that makes it completely tra uh, transparent, and then you stain the blood vessels, and then you use light sheet microscopy to obtain uh, images, and then you have to use all this fancy machine learning. Uh, uh, Tool uh, or toolbox in order to actually get uh, a vascular network out, but but that that's data that is readily available from other uh, research groups. Uh, so this is what we use to guide uh, the simulations, uh, and we're currently sort of in our third uh, model iteration now. Um, so at the bottom here, you basically you have what we're trying to model. So these are the uh, slices of the mouse brain, which have been uh, segmented using neural networks. Uh, red here corresponds to cancer cells, and blue is is, is normal normal tissue. Um, so uh, Adam started out with a model where migration was based directly on the eigenvectors of the diffusion tensor diffusion tensor. Uh, uh, that's wrong. The, so the diffusion tensor. Uh, then I had a a, a master student Henrik uh, who. Uh, Instead, uh, sort of went, uh, looked at the uh, tractography and from there obtained white matter fibers and also included vascular data. And now Adam is back at it again and using fractional anisotropy instead uh, to get at white matter fibers and vascular data. Uh, and uh, so, so here are our attempts at, uh, or our previous attempts at, um, at trying to model uh, uh, this. Uh, so this is uh, by, so I'll get back to that, but, but this is just to show that it, it, it turned out to be more difficult than, than we thought initially. Um, so, so the current model then version 3.0, uh, we have a cellular automaton model, the cells, they live on a three dimensional grid with a voxel size of 14 microns squared. Uh, in each, each grid or each voxel can then contain many cells. We have three cells per voxel as a carrying capacity this is an underestimate, and it's because of computational uh, limitations. Uh, probably eight is a more sensible value, but instead we can just think of as one cell representing many. Um, here in the model, uh, proliferation is uh, increased by the presence of blood vessels, something that is, has been observed in, uh, in many contexts for, for GBM cells. 
uh, and migration is also is then biased by white matter fibers or by blood vessels. So we can have both this type of white matter invasion and the, peri uh, the perivascular invasion if we want in the model. Uh, and uh, I'm sort of running out of time, I sense, so I won't go into much of the detail here, but uh, basically... Uh, you have time, Philip. I have time, okay. Um, so the the uh, rate of cell division has some base value and then it's influenced by the presence of blood vessels. The presence of blood vessels is calculated by looking at a ball of radius three around the position of the cell and just counting what is the, what is the fraction of voxels that contain blood vessels. Uh, and, that, that, and then we have a parameter which, which basically uh, modulates how, how much uh, blood vessels increase the rate of cell division. Uh, for bias in movement, we do a similar thing. So, uh, for so if we have a red, this is a, a, a cancer cell. It looks in the at all voxels that lie sort of in the positive x direction, uh, and we we calculate a contribution from those that decreases with distance. So if you have a white matter voxel near you, uh, it counts for more as more than one which is very distant uh, at, at a large distance. And this we do up to a, a, in, within a ball of, of radius 10. Um, we can then calculate like a, a, the probability to move in the positive x direction. Uh, and it has three different contributions. It has a random contribution uh, so if so, these are these are the bias uh, coefficients. So this is the bias for the white matter. Oh, sorry, for the blood vessel, and this is for the white matter fibers. So uh, if we begin, imagine that we set these to zero, then we have homogeneous random walk. Uh, all these coefficients are just one sixth, so going up, down, east, west, and so on. Uh, these can be larger than zero, but the sum of them has to be less than one. Uh, so you, you still retain some random aspect here, even if these are non-zero, and then you have the bias here to move along the along blood vessels or along white matter fibers. Um, okay, so this is an example of what a simulation might look at, uh, might look like. Uh, we have a lot of different parameters in the model. I won't go into detail. I just Sort of showed the most important here. So this is the the the, the, the blood vessel bias is 0.5, uh, and the white matter bias here is, is 0.2. Uh, so we see that the cells are sort of uh, moving along some sort of structures. We can't really see them here, but but they are uh, migrating uh, and dividing. And you see that you see you can form the you see the formation of these sort of lumps. And this is typically when they hit like a blood vessel. Uh, they have an increased rate of cell division. So you get like a, some sort of uh, high density of tumor cells around that, uh, around that blood vessel. Um, so so uh, that's what it looks so like. Is uh, that, so, um, can I ask a question? Is that, yeah. what's the scale there? Because is it just a small part of the brain or is it like- No, this is an entire mouse brain. This is what so you see here is the most. So, so, so the initial mouse. condition here is a bit exaggerated, but I was going to say but, it's a hell of a big tumor initially, right? Yeah, but these mouse brains are not so large. I mean, they're like yeah, uh, I know, I know, they're like a half a centimeter or something. Um, yeah. So, so they are very small. Um, I assume you are aware of the work that Jill published a couple of years back on migration and proliferation, combining imaging and. Yeah, cell. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some uh, technical issues or sort of um, challenges here. It is to uh, comparing the simulation output with data because we have these images. The brains on these images are sort of uh, sometimes they're a bit torn, they're rotated, they're maybe a bit sort of um, compressed. So so we have to we have to struggle a bit to to uh, align the images with the computational domain. And, and there, Adam has done a great job at, at figuring out how to do that. Uh, then we also have the problem of uh, sort of quantifying similarity between images. So it could look like this, for example, that this is our experimental tumor, the, the 
this color here. And then we have uh, the simulation uh, is the green and the overlap is in white. So the question is how similar are these tumors? Uh, and here, there are many different ways to go about. Um, one way is the Jacquard index, which is the quotient of the uh, intersection divided by the union of these two sets. That has turned out to work fairly well. Um, but there is an, a problem here is that what if you form a tumor which looks maybe exactly like the one you want, but it's just shifted by a certain distance? Uh, then it turns out that the, the Wasserstein metric is one way of, of, uh, of going about because that metric would, would score a high similarity between uh, those two sets. Um, but in the end, it turned out that this simple Jacquard index is, is, has, has done the, the best job so far. Uh, but I'll get back to one idea that we have uh, when it comes to uh, similarity. Does that account for density? Oh. Sorry? Does that account for density? No, it doesn't. So here we use like, a, we, we, we do a thresholding of both the simulation and the, uh, the, 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 the um, both the simulation and the experimental data. Uh, but yeah. So, and then we use approximate Bayesian computation to infer parameters. And here we're looking at four parameters at, uh, that, that defines the, the simulation. So we have the division rate, the migration rate, and then the white matter and blood vessel bias. Uh, and this, as a summary statistic, we then use one of these distance measures. Uh, and Henrik, who was my uh, master's student, he did a great job at testing this model on synthetic data and he showed that the summary statistics improves the modern fit and also that it does uh, fairly well in some situations, but that when you want to infer the rate of migration and proliferation, then looking at just one threshold value becomes problematic. And this is down to uh, the, the, what also happens in the Fisher equation uh, that the uh, velocity of the front is determined by product of the, of the diffu diffusivity and the, the, the rate of proliferation. So, so it's difficult to infer both with just a single threshold value. But if you, if you use multiple threshold values, it turns out that we can improve the estimate. But instead, there's, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in the, in the posterior distribution here uh, when it comes to the, um, the migration rate. But, but, um, yeah, so, uh, so let me show some preliminary results of what Adam is doing now. So, so in, in, uh, here we're just uh, looking at what's a single slice of the brain and we're trying to replicate this, this growth pattern here. Uh, and we use the ABC, so we generate every circle here is a, a parameter uh, setting. We generate lots of them, 10,000, and then we take the best, I think 1% or something like that, uh, into our posterior distribution. In reality, this posterior distribution is four-dimensional, and what's here shown here are the sort of two-dimensional marginal distributions. So here we have the, um, the migration rate and the rate of division, and here we have the, uh, the, the bias for, for blood vessel and for white matter. And here, this is white because we never generate parameter values here because we have this constraint that the sum of them has to be less than, less than one. Uh, and um, the red circles here are the accepted parameter values. Uh, so for migration and proliferation, it sort of looks, looks okay. We have sort of, they're fairly concentrated around a certain region in parameter space. Uh, whereas for, for the, the biases, there is, it's less, we're less confident that we're sort of finding the right value because they're more spread out along here, although they seem to be concentrated more to this region of very high white matter bias and low blood vessel bias. So uh, if we look at the highest scoring simulation here among the, among the thousand uh, where we use the Jacquard index as a, sorry, uh, Jacquard index as the, um, as a similarity, then we see that it, it, it fairly well sort of mimics this migration along the corpus callosum. So, uh, so again here, uh, this color here is the experimental data, the sort of pinkish, uh, and then the simulation is the white, and then where we have overlap is, oh, sorry, the simulation is green and where we have overlap is, is white. Uh, and we see that we can, we capture, uh, we capture this uh, migration along the corpus callosum what we don't, what we can't really capture is this very sharp border here, possibly induced by some sort of membrane in, in, in the brain, uh, so that the real tumor really stops here 
whereas the simulated tumor sort of spills into this region here. Um, so, uh, but 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 so still a fairly fairly good result. But but there are many challenges uh, when it comes to this. Uh, the the fact that we're we're looking at the tumor from one animal, but then the diffusion tensor imaging and the vascular data comes is a completely different data set that has been generated by another research group. Uh, and this 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 makes it sort of uh, challenging. We also are struggling with good summary statistics and with this problem of aligning the images and the simulation outputs. And, and one idea that we have uh, is to maybe train a neural network to identify parameters from a simulation uh, and then apply it to the experimental data while it's trained. So we can generate a lot of training data using our model uh, to train our neural network to, to, to predict parameters. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can then apply it on the experimental data uh, to figure out what is the rate of division, the migration rate, the white matter bias, and the blood vessel bias. Uh, so these are some, some future ideas. Uh, okay, so I want to say, I'm, I'll rather just show the image here of, of the, the tissue um, tissue culture. So here, what we're looking at are, uh, are green cells, or maybe I can, sorry, here. So this is the whole image. Uh, the vessels are stained with uh, in red here, and the tumor cells are GFP stained. Uh, the tumor cells are injected into the, into the mouse brain, and then after 11 weeks, the mouse is sacrificed. And then we put this uh, in a controlled environment microscope, and we can acquire images like this. And the idea here is to try to, to uh, understand the interactions between the blood vessels and the cancer cells to, uh, to a larger degree, uh, and, and maybe use that information and put it into the uh, model of uh, the, the in vivo model, uh, where, the, where we have parameters that relate to the vasculature. So, so that's, that's one idea that we have. Uh, okay, so, Hello? yeah. Uh, would you go back? How are you doing? <laughs> it's, this is great. Um, so what you were showing there was the red was the blood vessels and the green was the uh, yeah. exactly. tumor cells. So um, I'm wondering how you use that bias on, you have a lot of single blood vessels there. And, and also, I mean, throughout the brain, you have all sorts of sizes of blood vessels. So they do start to get a little windy versus like really thick ones that cells like to move along. Yeah. I just wonder if you have any threshold on what you consider a viable blood vessel to move along. So or in, the, it's in the model, it's, uh, it's very sort of naive. We only count voxels that are classified as, as blood uh, vessels that come from the vascular atlas. So we don't really uh -huh. care about the the size will sort of inf will will influence the sort of magnitude of the bias, but we never we don't disregard any blood vessels uh, in the in the in the atlas. So okay, so, so just but, yeah, density. of course. The, sorry. So more of a density. Uh... Exactly, but it will also uh -huh. guide migration uh, to some extent, but we're not quite sure how well it works. Um, the, mm -hmm. the problem with these perineural one, the tumor, perivascular tumors is that when you look at a slice, basically what you see are sort of dots of cancer of like uh, distinct uh, small tumors that have all been m migrating and dividing along blood vessels. And that turns out to be very difficult uh, with the current model to, to estimate rates from because the data is sort of very, uh, the density is so low. Um, and maybe this has to do with the fact that we're using this Jacquard index so that we have, uh, it's difficult to, to, um, to calculate a, a similarity. If you look at the images, then maybe it's sort of obvious to you, but when you want to, uh, when you ask a computer to put a number on it, then it becomes much more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so, Thank uh, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to end here with, uh, saying something about comparing parameters across scales and assays. So, so what I've talked about here is taking these patient-derived cell uh, cultures and doing different assays uh, on them. And from that, uh, sorry, obtain um, 
some numbers uh, parameters. Uh, and here we can think of, or I like to think of this as sort of the phenotype of, of the cells here, what they're doing uh, in different contexts. So the first question that comes to mind is then, how does, um, how does these parameters that we obtain in different contexts compare, just like Sandy mentioned before. Uh, so that's something that we will uh, look into. Uh, then we also have this other side that I, I'm not really involved in uh, at the moment, which is all the genomic data and the transcriptomic data and the proteomic data. And this you can think of like the, the, the genotype. Uh, and here you can start looking at uh, what's the, what mutations do you find? What is the, the frequency? What are the expression levels and, and, uh, and so on? Uh, and, and sort of the ultimate goal of the collaboration with the Nolander lab is somehow to tie this, uh, tie this together uh, and see uh, if we get reliable estimates of the phenotypes of the, uh, of the PDCs, can we connect that with what's going on at the genetic level? And this is sort of the, the, the holy grail of the genotype phenotype map. Uh, but, but that's something that we're uh, hoping to address in the future. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm running uh, quite late, so I won't uh, take much longer. But in, in summary, I've talked about these different assays and that we're trying to estimate parameters uh, and uh, in the future compare them and then hopefully relate them to, to genetic or genotypic uh, data from, from the same uh, cell lines. And funny wise, this is, uh, we're, I'm supported by the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research uh, and the other ones are mostly supporting uh, Sven's lab work, uh, but I'd be happy to take uh, more questions if you have any. Thanks, Philip, that was great. Yes. Excellent. Uh, I'm sure there is questions. Yes. Thanks. By the way. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, and nice, a very, very nice work. I'm, I'm, I'm trying sort of to reconcile so the part, first part of the talk and then the mm -hmm. in vivo scenario. So obviously yeah. when you see uh, cells and you know, culture dishes there, yeah, initially sparse and they're, so it's quite quite clear that there are many cell lines that exhibit this uh, inhibition of growth with, at low densities and uh, with varying degree. But how do you relate this to uh, context in vivo where cells are typically much closer to each other? Even like when you treat this tumor, there's a reduction in cellularity, but usually the tumor shrinks and the distances between cells are not as uh, strongly affected. And perhaps related to it, when, when you describe the migration, what's known about interaction between the tumor cells and normal glia in the brain? Are there any, um, is there a kind of exchange of, of paracrine factors that might sort of support proliferation and survival of, of glioblastoma cells? Yes. So. Uh... About the uh, the LE effect. So of course, yes. Yeah, so you're right. This is a, a sort of artificial setting where the cells are uh, uh, in, um, in in vitro. And uh, but it has been speculated that um, uh, that this might affect the the dynamics uh, at recurrence um, of, of these tumors. That the LE effect uh, might uh, delay the the rate of, of or increase the, the the time until recurrence. Uh, so yeah, that's but, one sort but, of. But, but is an umbrella indication. term that basically covers uh, observed inhibition of growth rate in irrespective of the mechanism. And it looks like there are likely to be multiple mechanisms that could yeah, manifest yeah. to the effect. Yeah, no, exactly, and that's what the uh, that's what our referee tried to uh, point out as well. So uh, of course, yeah, they, there are probably multiple, but I think that. Uh, looking at this sort of uh, single cell image the where we can look, track single cells, then, then that will at least give us a bit more information about uh, how, uh, how the local density uh, affects. Uh, but, uh, but of course, I'm not 100% I'm not sure how to sort of take this to the uh, in, vivo, in vivo perspective. Uh, I mean, one thing that is related to is, is how, how likely you are to induce a tumor when, when, you, when you inject. Um, uh, and you see that some cell lines are much more difficult or are much less likely to actually form tumors when they are injected, whereas other, other ones require rather low uh, densities. So, but, but, but that's also more on the experimental side and, and maybe not so much on the, on the clinical side. But, um, and then about the, the second question about the, uh, the paracrine, uh, in interactions with um, with the normal glial. I, I'm a, I'm unsure about that. I don't know actually um, what um, 
what is known about because about like the thing the thing is there I mean, if you, you have clear tumor cells crawling away from the main tumor and so if there's no interaction uh, to support their proliferation you might have yeah. an elite effect during this sort of uh, invasion yeah but i mean it could be the normal levels of, of growth factors in the brain are sufficient to mm -hmm. to sort of sustain their their division or well, maybe at a lower rate uh, at, during some time before they they form a new uh, sort of before the density becomes large enough locally. Um, hi, Philip. Uh, this is Raphael. I have a question about um, the sort of model setup for that uh, like three dimensional mouse brain model. So, yep. like, specifically, it, it looks like there's a lot of um, like voxels and agents mm -hmm. going around. So, performance yeah. becomes an, an issue there. So, I'm curious, like, what you know, language or modeling setup did you use? And like, did you have some kind of um, distributed computing thing or, you know, supercomputer or what have you to like, you know, facilitate that? Yeah, so so Adam's uh, initial model was was uh, was done in, in in MATLAB and then Henrik, my, the master student, uh, did everything all over again in Python. Uh, and, and it is the, 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 the sort of the running time is a limiting factor. Um, because so in, in the real system, we have something like uh, injection of, uh, I think, 50,000 cells. And then uh, it's estimated that the, when, this, when the mice are sacrificed, we have roughly a million cells. Uh, and that's definitely possible to simulate. But if we want to do inference, then we need to do this like 10,000 times over. And then it gets challenging. Uh, but we have the 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 um, approximate Bayesian computation that we have been running has uh, that has been done on on clusters, uh, but it hasn't really been uh, implemented in any sort of serious parallel way. Uh, it, you can just I mean one way to do it is just to assign different parts of the parameter space to to different uh, uh, to different nodes in the cluster, and then so so that way you can parallelize it. Uh, and and one way you can optimize or make it more efficient is also that you can um, you can just when when you do this uh, you you just run uh, the model for all these parameter values and then you save the data and then you can do all the similarity measurements and all the sort of ABC stuff offline on on the data uh, as that you have simulated and stored and that also speeds up things fairly uh, a lot. Um, it also means that you can change your, your mind a lot of times about the summary statistics that you want to use without going back to the cluster. Yeah, I'm surprised with Python that it runs at all, but maybe like you're using some kind of an efficient framework within Python. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough about the actual implementation, but uh, okay. So, but the movie that I showed that contained fifty thousand cells to to begin with uh, initially. So, and then it increases, I don't know, maybe twofold or so during the simulation. Um, it's uh, impressive. Thanks. Any other questions for Philip? Philip, um, yes, I mean, it's an incredible presentation, and clearly you have presented the breadth of models and uh, geoblastoma related questions. Um, I'm also very intrigued by the public goods thing, uh, just because obviously my interest in game theory as well. Um, yeah. But also, I think coming from where we come, uh, one natural question would be, can we use that therapeutically? Sorry, can we use? Like, it feels like you could target these target, this public goods, you know what they are. Yeah, so, so I did mention that you could, you could use these PDGF uh, inhibitor. Uh, you could simulate that. I don't, sorry? You, I, don't, I don't think you have the data, but you could at least just play with your model and see what happens when you inhibit them in your model. Yeah, for sure. You can do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be um, an issue. I think one of the problems with this uh, experimentally is that uh, there are many types of receptors, and then it's sort of, I think it's partly unclear how the, these, the, the, the binding or the, the drugs that inhibit the receptors are sort of promiscuous as well. So you're not exactly sure what you're inhibiting. Uh, which makes it, it difficult. Uh, but yeah, computationally, it wouldn't be a problem to, to investigate. Uh, what do you think it happens? Because clearly one of the things about these things is that um, usually when you target cells, the resistance emerges, but when you target public goods, then obviously the impact is, is from the selection point of view uh, there, but so, so much more indirect and the dynamics in terms of evolution might actually be quite different. So what's your guess? 
So, I mean, in the current setup uh, as that I talked about here, we don't really have any evolution because all the, it's just a single population. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm not sure um, uh, what would happen. I mean, you would, because if you, if you reduce the, uh, or if you inhibit the, the action of the public good, then you take down the growth rate. Uh, yeah, I don't know, actually. I have to, <laughs> I have yeah, to think enough. more about that, but it's a good idea. Yeah, another thing is obviously I also work a lot on AMS models. That's the reason that when I look at these things, and because we also get lots of experimental data from, from mouse models, but we are trying to make predictions about humans, that's really what's important to us, is, okay. is how you actually scale that up is really hard. Some of the models use clinical data to parameterize some of the values, but then some experimental data from mice to parameterize others, the sizes, the time scales, the length scales are different. How do you actually go around that? Yeah, so we have, I mean, so far, I haven't, in this context of sort of the glibostome, I haven't really thought about that. So at the moment, we're, I'm sort of happy to just uh, do models of the specific assays uh, instead of going all the way to, to humans. Uh, but hopefully we'll get there. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I think that the mathematical model can sort of be, uh, can support the work, uh, the, the work going, going there. But uh, uh, in the sort of context of what, what the Lalander lab is doing, then it makes much more sense for us to just yeah, uh, work on those assays rather than- do something. Fair enough. Yeah. I don't have an answer myself. Finally, <laughs> just very quick question. Uh, what's special about the 8th of February, 2020, other than us pre-COVID? Sorry, what's different what's from- special about the 8th of February, 2020? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I somehow, yeah, anyway. maybe I'm just dreaming myself back to pre-COVID times because I <laughs> obviously put the date there, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Thanks for noticing that, David. <laughs> Any other questions for Philip? I had another one. Um, I was wondering the uncertainty you see in the posterior distribution. Might some of this be attributable to um, heterogeneity in the migration rates among the tumor cells? Yeah, I mean, that, that could be, but we even see this, uh, we even see a sort of a, a fairly wide posterior, even when we're trying to do it on the model itself. So I think it says more, uh, it's probably a combination of like uh, problems with identifiability uh, of, of the model uh, and uh, heterogeneity among the cells. Um, so, uh, but what I showed you, the, the sort of the, the preliminary result that we have was sort of one of the nicer ones. And then in other cases, we have uh, we have a, a posterior which is much more stretched out, and and that is probably more down to sort of model misspecification that we're doing something wrong, uh, but we're not quite sure what <laughs> at the moment. Okay. If the summary statistics would include uh, some sort of metric of heterogeneity, it might render them stronger for the inference. Yeah, it could. Because it would be uh, multi-dimensional. Yeah. yeah, so what, cause what, yeah, what we've been playing around with are just sort of image-based metrics. And, and of course, one could also look at other ones, uh, look at the shape, for example, of the tumor, look at the, uh, what the, how the tumor boundary looks like and so on. So yeah, so there are many, different ways of, of going about it. Um, yeah, but that's choosing summer that's statistics good. is difficult, <laughs> for sure. It is, yeah. And maybe the neural network will solve that for us. Who knows? We'll see uh, <laughs> if, our, if the idea that we have works. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Philip. Um, I get to ask the Thanks. last question. Um, in part, you know, it's inspiring, I think, for me, that you're still thinking about genotype phenotype relationships but obviously that's a very big question but i'm intrigued about how you're thinking of tackling that in, in the sense of i can see what you're trying to do phenotype wise but obviously you didn't mention at all genotype wise no do you have any so yeah i don't know actually yeah i don't know exactly what kind of framework but i i mean i'm thinking some sort of statistical framework to do this, uh, um, some type of regression or something. I mean, you have all this, this, this whole, say that you have all these measured uh, phenotype values on one side, and then on the other side, you have this the massive, um, 
massive amount of, of, of genetic and, and data and, and transcriptomic data, then you, you need some sort of, I don't know, uh, regularized regression or something that, that, that to make sure that you don't overfit this the relationship between genotype and phenotype. And, uh, and, and in Sven's group, they're already doing quite a lot of that already on the, on the genotype data. So this type of uh, lasso regression and, and so on, and rich regression models. So I'm, I'm thinking something like that, um, something along those lines. We've been looking at this, trying to basically embed genomes in CAs and watching them evolve, right? But of course you can do that beautifully when it's neutral, when there actually isn't a functional change. But the minute you embed any sort of functional change, you dictate the mapping, right? Yeah. And so, you know, connecting that now with real data can be done in very selective ways, but you can't do it in any some sort of spontaneous evolving way, right? The closest, I think, was what we did back then. And of course, yeah. that's very much an abstraction. But there are people doing very sophisticated um, sort of machine learning networks of yeah. um, you know almost every process in the cell. I'm sure you've seen some of those insane whole cell models. Uh, yeah, are, yeah. Right. I'm not saying that that's the right route to go, but um, you know, focusing on maybe specific processes and subsets of genes might be a smarter move. Than... Yeah, exactly. And also, I think well, at least as a first step, it has it. It makes sense to look at uh, some some sort of static genotype phenotype map that only sort of relates what mutations and so on to sort of the, the phenotype values that we have me measured uh, uh, in these assays and, and, and not try to do something dynamic where, as, 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 uh, as we did, uh, where, where you try to relate the environmental variables and so on to, to that, because I think it's, as a first step, it's just, uh, it's a bit overwhelming, I think. Uh, yeah, we were a bit ambitious back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thanks a lot, um, and thanks everyone. Um, and Philip, I hope hope you uh, don't develop full blown symptoms, and all goes smoothly for you. No, I think actually I'm, I'm yeah I'm I peaked already, and uh, I survived this, so I should be should be fine. <laughs> anyway, hopefully next time it's in person. Okay. Yeah, let's hope so. Take, take care. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.